Several years ago, I found this really cool looking handmade wooden clock at a craft fair I was at with my wife that I intended to buy, but unfortunately I missed out on it. And afterwards, I kind of thought to myself, you know, I could probably make one of these things. And it was that venture that reinvigorated my passion for woodworking and launched my career in woodworking. Today, I'm going to go through the process of how I make these clocks that I sell on a regular basis. I'm going to be using Ambrosia Maple for this build. It'll be a 24-inch clock, so I start out by cutting all the rough boards to length. I cut them slightly over 24 inches to give myself some wiggle room as I go back and firm up sizes later. The boards came with a face that was flat enough so that I could skip the joiner and just run things through the planer to surface the boards. I did, however, have to clean up one edge on each board on the jointer. I then cleaned up the other edge on the table saw. This is also when I cut each board to the width that it needed to be for the face of the clock. Once I had all the boards at the correct width, I took them to the workbench to lay them out and figure out what order they would show up in to make up the clock face. Now, I probably should have put the clamps down first and then figured out the order of the boards, but I always forget to do this, so I have to move them and then get the clamps out and put everything back. I did make one last adjustment to the layout before getting ready to glue everything up. You've probably seen other woodworkers use these silicone brushes, and let me just be one more person to tell you how great they are and encourage you to get some. Once everything was glued and uh, ready to go, it was time to clamp the boards together. Now, there are several ways to clear wood glue from a workpiece after it's been clamped up. This is one of the more stupid ways to do it, and I strongly encourage you not to do it. I actually hurt myself really badly by catching this chisel in the hand, so don't do it this way. After a week or so of recovery and returning to the shop with my Michael Jackson glove, it was time to flatten out the board after it had been glued up. I did this on the drum sander because it was too wide to fit through my planer. I know there are some people who like using their drum sander as a surfacer and thicknesser instead of their planer. I hate it. It takes forever, and this took a long time to do. Once I had the board flattened, I needed to clean up one side so I could reference it on the fence on my table saw to cut everything to length. I don't own a track saw, so this was my next best option. It works really well, so certainly no complaints from me on this idea. Then it was time to trim the other edge and cut the board to length. I had to use my gripper because my cotton glove doesn't grip the work surface very well at all. With the workpiece cut to size, it was now time to locate the center of this board. For those of you who don't know, here's a nifty trick. You simply line up the corners and connect them with lines. Where they intersect is the exact center of the workpiece. I need this both as the location for the clock motor as well as the anchor for my circle cutting jig. With the center found, it was now time to drill a hole through the piece in the center of the board. The particle board pieces are to help drill the hole at a 90 degree angle versus some other skewed angle. With all that done, it was now time to cut the circle for the face of the clock. I'm using a circle cutting jig with a router to do this. There are other ways to accomplish this that are faster. You can build a jig and use a bandsaw to do this, which is very quick. Unfortunately, I don't currently have a bandsaw blade thin enough to cut at the curve that I would need for the face of the clock. So I've done it this way for a long time. It works really well, and it just continues to be the way I do it until I go out and buy a bandsaw blade that would help me in cutting curves like this.
with the circle cut, I wanted to put a round over profile on the edge of the clock. The clock face is three quarters of an inch thick, so I'm using a three eighths inch round over bit. I also introduced to you a highly functional and yet probably the least sexy router table on all of YouTube. I think henceforth I'll refer to it as the fanny pack router table. Next, it was time to lay out the position of the numbers on the face of the clock. There are a couple different ways to do this. It's easiest with a compass. I don't own a compass large enough to accomplish this, so I use the string method instead. With the numbers all laid out, it was time to drill the holes that will be used to thread the Roman numerals into the face of the clock. Next up, it was time to sand, and like all woodworking projects, it's the most boring part of the entire thing. I usually start at about 60 grit and work my way up to 220 or so, sometimes 180 depending on the project. I wasn't totally happy with the way the round over bit left the edge, so I wanted to make it a little smoother with some hand sanding. In between each grit movement, I hand sanded with the same grit before going to the next one on the random orbital sander. The clock motor shaft isn't long enough to fit entirely through the clock face at three quarters of an inch thick. So I have to cut out a notch to get the shaft all the way through. I do this with a router, and I, in this case, used a palm router to do it. I could have used a plunge router that I have with a handy dust collection port on it, but there's no light on that router, so I choose this one because it makes it easier to see. It's just a whole lot messier, and I need to stop every once in a while to clean up the sawdust created by this router. Now you could make a jig or a guide for this process. Um, I've always just freehanded this and it's worked perfectly fine for me. I like to put these little support brackets on the back of the clock and the reason for this will make a lot more sense a little bit later in this video. This is just how I secure them to the back of the clock. And of course, we can't forget to stamp our logo on our work. And now it was time to apply finish to the workpiece. I'm using satin deft lacquer in this case. There's really no special reason. I was finishing the walnut slab in the background, which I definitely wanted the lacquer on. I've done several other types of finish on clocks before. There are really no rules. They don't get a lot of surface abuse, so you can use whatever you want to. With the lacquer dried and cured, it's time to thread in the Roman numerals. I chose brown leather in this case. I've done several things from jute twine to white rope. I just thought that the brown leather had a nice contrast in this case. The clock motors come with D-rings to hang them on the wall, but I don't trust them for the weight of a solid wood clock. So I instead came up with this system for a hanging hardware uh, some time ago, and it's what I use. They're simple hooks, and I run some galvanized steel from post to post as the mechanism that will hang the clock on the wall. And yes, that is curly maple that is acting as the back brace of the clock. I didn't have any scrap ambrosia maple, but I did have some scrap curly maple lying around, so that's what I used. And the last step in the process is to put the clock motor in place and attach the hands to the motor shaft. 
And here it is in all its glory. I really like how this one came out with the contrasting ambrosia. I already sold this clock to a couple who thought it would complement the white ash trim in their house. I hope they're enjoying it as much as I enjoyed making it. Hey, thanks for watching, everybody, and I will catch you on the next one.